Welcome to this class. It is about sustainable metallurgical science and engineering. Please recall, that I use an artificial voice for reading this class. My name is Dear Krabber. I work in this field for about 30 years. I hope to share some of my insights on the role of metallurgy on sustainability with you. The production of metals, has a huge impact on the environment. It causes about 8% of the total global energy consumption, and 30% of all industrial greenhouse gas emissions. This lecture series, is about approaches, to make metallurgical production cleaner, and shows, how metals can help, to make other products more sustainable. The class today introduces the concept of a hydrogen economy. The notion of a fully hydrogen-based economy, is currently an overstatement, but there are indeed good reasons, to consider it as one important future pillar for sustainable industry, transport, and energy solutions. But why is all that of relevance for materials scientists and metallurgists? As I will show in this class, many of the devices and machines, required for production, infrastructure, transport, storage, and consumption of hydrogen, depend critically on materials, that withstand hydrogen exposure. Hydrogen has two faces when it comes to sustainability. The positive one, is that it might be one of the essential future pillars for a more sustainable industry. The negative one, is that hydrogen is a destroyer of materials, mainly through the so-called hydrogen embrittlement effect. It is important to know, which parts are needed, and which boundary conditions materials experience in a future hydrogen economy, in order to develop materials that do not undergo hydrogen-induced embrittlement. This ranges from materials for water splitting, tubes and valves for transport, devices for storing it in a cryogenic, solid, or high-pressure condition, or gas turbines that can use it as a fuel. Making materials fit for the hydrogen economy, therefore, means, that we first have to understand, the chemical, thermal, and kinetic conditions, materials are exposed to in this context. This class is part of an entire lecture series, about sustainable metallurgical and materials science and engineering. In case you missed the introduction, you can find it on YouTube, when searching for the term, sustainable metallurgy. What are the teaching targets? At the end of this class, you can explain the following items. The main elements of an economy, that uses hydrogen as an energy carrier, such as production, transport, and dues. The required infrastructure components, such as tanks, valves, or tubes, and the materials, that are needed, to make them. A few pros and cons about electrons and protons as energy carriers. The efficiency of using hydrogen in industry, transport and heating, and the markets behind such an economy. It is essential to understand in that context, that someone in such a new industry field, needs to make money with it, otherwise green technologies do not get off the ground. Finally, you learn about characteristic boundary conditions, that materials experience in a hydrogen-based economy, and what types of degradation mechanisms they experience due to hydrogen attack. These targets mirror the contents of this class. We revisit the Paris Protocol and shed some light on the history of using hydrogen. We discuss some basic properties of hydrogen and the main elements of a hydrogen economy. We review the major roles of hydrogen as well as markets and technology readiness. Special attention is placed on the most important infrastructure components. Further, we discuss some efficiency considerations and boundary conditions for materials, in terms of temperature, mechanical pressure, and chemical partial pressure. This is needed, to understand the nature of the multiple interactions, between materials and hydrogen. The Paris Protocol was signed by nearly 200 countries, with a promise, to keep global warming below 2 Kelvin above pre-industrial levels. Many countries, particularly those with high gas and oil export, did not sign it. Keeping this promise, requires drastic measures. More specific, it requires, 
to cut CO2 emissions by 60% by the year 2050, although the global population will grow by about 2 billion during the same period. This will only work, if drastic changes are implemented. Examples are higher energy efficiency, renewable energy, low-carbon energy carriers, and the capture and use of CO2. In these fields, materials science and metallurgy, occupy key roles. This diagram reveals, how drastic the changes have to be, to reach the goals of the Paris Protocol. For reaching the 2 degrees limit, emissions of CO2, must be reduced by 13 to 16 gigatons by the year 2030. For a goal of 1.5 degrees, reductions must amount to even 26 to 29 gigatons CO2 by 2030. When considering, that about one third of all global industrial CO2 emissions, come from the metallurgical sector, the enormous role of this field for limiting global warming, becomes clear. The data show, that the current range of temperature anomalies, relative to pre-industrial times, is already reaching beyond 1 degree. This drastic increase of the temperature, is attributed, to the increasing content of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Therefore, using hydrogen as energy carrier for fuel, heat, energy buffering, energy storage, and energy transport, emerges as an alternative to our current carbon-based energy supply. Allow me a brief excursion into history. As early as 1874, Jules Verne, wrote in his famous novel, The Mysterious Island. Water will one day be employed as fuel. Hydrogen and oxygen, which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light, of an intensity of which coal is not capable. Real history, is sometimes even more stunning, than fiction told in novels. Early records suggest, that Robert Boyle, produced hydrogen already as early as 1671, in a series of corrosion tests, when experimenting with iron and acids. Finally, in the year 1766, Henry Cavendish was the first to recognize hydrogen as a distinct element. Towards the end of the 18th century, Isaac de Rivers, a Franco-Swiss artillery officer and inventor, designed several steam-powered carriages. His experience with cannons, had led him to think about using an explosive charge, to drive a piston instead of steam. In 1804 he began to experiment with explosions, created inside a cylinder with a piston. His first designs were for a stationary engine to power a pump. The engine was powered by a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen gases, ignited to create an explosion within the cylinder, and drive the piston out. The gas mixture was ignited by an electric spark, in the same manner as a modern combustion engine. In 1806, he applied the design to what became the world's first internal combustion engine-driven automobile. Let us look at some features of hydrogen. It is the first element in the periodic table, with an atomic number of 1, and an atomic weight of about 1 gram per mole. Its most frequent isotope, has a proton as nucleus and one electron. Under normal conditions, it is a colorless and odorless gas, formed by diatomic molecules, with a molecular weight of about 2 grams per mole. Its boiling point of about minus 253 degrees centigrade is very low, which explains the high energy costs when liquefying it, for instance for transport purposes. The most important commercial use of hydrogen, is the ammonia synthesis. Hydrogen has a very high energy density value per mass, with 142 megajoule per kilogram. Yet, this is of little relevance in applications, where volume matters. For instance the volume available for fuel tanks is limited, and the diameter of pipelines cannot be increased at will. For most practical assessments, it is more meaningful, to refer the energy content of fuel gases to a reference volume. Another issue is the synthesis of hydrogen. Its use in transportation, makes only sense, when green energy is used for water splitting. However, 
it can then be more efficient, to use green electricity directly for charging batteries, for instance for automotive applications. These are some of the trade-offs, that need to be considered. What are the major possible roles of hydrogen, in a future economy? By providing a means of long-term energy storage, it acts as an energy carrier, and buffer, for better green energy system resilience. Through that, it can enable large-scale integration of renewable electricity into the energy system. It allows for the distribution of energy across regions, and across the natural wind and sun cycles. Also, it decarbonizes end-use applications. However, please note, that hydrogen can be produced with either a low or high carbon footprint. This means that it is not in all cases a greener solution compared to the use of carbon-based fuels. It must be also considered, that the hydrogen route always has a lower total efficiency, than direct electricity use. However, currently, much of the green energy cannot be transported and used in sufficient quantity, because it is mostly not produced where it is most urgently needed. Another important role of hydrogen is the decarbonizing of the transportation sector. Today's transportation depends almost entirely on fossil fuels, creating more than 20% of all CO2 emissions. Hydrogen powered vehicles, with their high performance, and the convenience offered by fast refueling times, can complement battery electric vehicles, to achieve a broad decarbonization of transport segments. Hydrogen also offers opportunities, to decarbonize CO2 intensive industry processes. For instance, it can help to decarbonize processes that are hard to electrify, in particular those requiring high grade heat. It can also be used, to generate heat and power for industrial uses. Hydrogen also helps to decarbonize building heat and power. In regions with existing natural gas networks, hydrogen could piggyback on existing infrastructure, and provide a cost-effective means, of heating decarbonization. Another major role of hydrogen, is to provide clean feedstock for industry. The current use of hydrogen, as industry feedstock, amounts already to more than 55 million tons per year. This huge amount, is nowadays mainly provided by methane gas reforming, producing the so-called grey hydrogen. This could be fully decarbonized, by using water splitting, propelled by green energy sources. Hydrogen could also be employed, to produce cleaner chemicals, and CO2 reduced green steel. The former could be achieved, by being used as a chemical feedstock, in part in combination with captured carbon. The latter could be done, by using hydrogen as a reducing agent for iron ore. A hydrogen-based economy must be prepared, to produce, package, handle, store, transport, and finally consume hydrogen. However, the energy and sustainability challenges cannot be solved, when the energy consumed to make, store, or deliver hydrogen is of the same order of magnitude, as the energy content of the delivered fuel. This applies particularly, when considering hydrogen as a propellant for fuel cell cars, compared to battery-only solutions. However, batteries have a rather negative environmental, social, and carbon fingerprint, through their synthesis, manufacturing and recycling burdens. These factors must be considered, when comparing hydrogen with battery solutions. More specific, it is important to account for both, how much energy is consumed for compression, liquefaction, transportation, storage, and transfer of hydrogen, and does the accumulated efficiency of this chain really represent a responsible use of sustainable electrical energy sources, and what does a life cycle assessment say about the synthesis and manufacturing chains of alternative techniques? Such a complete life cycle analysis, that takes all efficiency and manufacturing factors associated with these technologies from cradle to grave into account, reveals, that hydrogen is indeed a good link and buffer solution between renewable physical and chemical energy, for instance as chemical feedstock for the industry, but most likely, it might come to the end consumer, who wants to ride a vehicle, chemically packaged in some form, for instance as a synthetic consumer-friendly fuel like hydrocarbons or ammonia.
Let us now take a closer look at hydrogen prices, costs, and markets. This diagram shows the costs of producing hydrogen from renewables and from fossil fuels. It teaches us a number of essential aspects. First, there's nearly a factor of six in cost difference between the lowest and the highest price for producing hydrogen. Second, the lowest price is currently achieved by steam gas reforming of natural gas. This is also how currently most of the available hydrogen is globally produced. Third, using photovoltaic renewable energy for hydrogen synthesis is currently the most expensive option. Fourth, it is very interesting to learn that an optimal combination of low cost wind energy and low cost electrolysis is already now practically competitive with fossil hydrogen production. This means that it is worth to take a closer look where low price wind energy is available. This is possible through weather satellites and detailed wind and temperature tracking around the globe. Such data allow us to identify those regions with the highest solar irradiation exposure and with the highest wind energy. When considering the cost chart we discussed before, regions of very high wind intensity are of special interest for price reasons. From this perspective, certain areas in South America, in the Middle East, and in the Himalaya, are particularly attractive. However, irrespective of these great opportunities, it must be considered during the transition period, that natural gas and not renewable energy is currently the primary source of hydrogen production, accounting for around three quarters of the annual global dedicated hydrogen production of around 70 million tons. This accounts for about 6% of global natural gas use. A consequence of the increasing market for hydrogen is, that this production, based on steam gas reforming of methane, is responsible for CO2 emissions of around 830 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, equivalent to the CO2 emissions, of the United Kingdom and Indonesia combined. This means, that further market growth for hydrogen, must be quickly switched to inexpensive renewable energy sources, since otherwise, the growing market for hydrogen, increases rather than reduces global CO2 emissions. Another aspect that needs to be considered, is that producing all of today's dedicated hydrogen output from electricity, would result in an electricity demand of 3,600 terawatt hours, more than the total annual electricity generation of the European Union. This simple calculation underlines, that the growing hydrogen demand of the markets in highly populated and industrialized regions of the world, must be covered by a global network of inexpensive renewable energy sources, in conjunction with low-price electrolysis or even steam-based water splitting, and cheap transcontinental transport, similar as for gas and oil today. This slide, shows the technology readiness level, for some of the targeted hydrogen consumer technologies. The technology readiness level concept, is a method for estimating the maturity of technologies. The highest level of 9, states, that the technology has been proven ready to be used in real operational environments. A mid-scale value of 4 means, that the technology has been validated under laboratory or idealized conditions only, but broader market entry is not yet reached. The diagram shows some mature techniques, such as the use of hydrogen as rocket fuel, but also emerging techniques like hydrogen-driven trains and vehicles, and early stage systems, such as the use of hydrogen in gas or flying turbines, or as a fuel for ships. Another important technology under development, is the use of hydrogen as a reduction agent for metallic ores, such as for instance for iron making. Hydrogen's potential can be realized only, if its production becomes carbon free. 98% is currently generated using carbon intensive methods, referred to as, grey hydrogen. The other 2% is produced via electrolysis, a chemical reaction that splits water into its constituents hydrogen and oxygen. Only a tiny proportion of this is currently powered by emission-free renewable energy sources, making it green hydrogen. Green hydrogen costs, are currently 3 to 4 times higher, than carbon-based production. 
falling costs of new wind and solar plants, as well as falling costs of the equipment needed to produce green hydrogen, will mitigate this challenge. As renewable installations grow, power capacity will exceed average loads or even peak power demand, and thus increasingly face the risk of being effectively switched off for limited periods. This is already the case today. Rather than curbing this generation, it can serve as clean power to split water with electrolyzers, dramatically reducing the costs of hydrogen production. This is sometimes also referred to as white hydrogen, meaning, to use excess green and grid-based sources for hydrogen production. Steam gas reforming is currently the cheapest way to produce hydrogen. This process and uses light hydrocarbons such as methane and naphtha as the source. The first step is synthesis gas generation, in which a desulfurized hydrocarbon is mixed with process steam over a nickel-based catalyst in the reformer. The second step is supplemental hydrogen generation, in which the synthesis gas enters the shift converter. Finally, the third step is gas purification, where the primary diluent, CO2, is removed in a scrubbing unit. The hydrogen produced by this method typically has a purity of 96 to 98 percent. A big disadvantage of this method is the production of CO2 emissions during the process. Hydrogen produced with this method is also referred to as brown hydrogen if the carbon is not captured during the process, and blue hydrogen if the carbon is captured. Electrolysis is the electrocatalytic decomposition of liquid water into hydrogen and oxygen, due to the passage of an electric current. It is also called water splitting. For this process, a direct current electrical power source is connected to two electrodes, typically made from platinum or iridium, which are placed in water. The associated half reactions are catalyzed at the electrified solid liquid gas three phase interfaces of the anode and the cathode. Hydrogen forms at the negatively charged cathode, where electrons from the cathode enter the water, and are being donated to the hydrogen cations, reducing them to hydrogen. At the positively charged anode, an oxidation reaction occurs, generating oxygen gas and transferring electrons to the anode, to complete the circuit. Assuming ideal Faraday efficiency, the amount of hydrogen generated, is twice the amount of oxygen, and both are proportional to the total electrical charge conducted by the solution. However, in real cells, competing side reactions occur, resulting in different products and less than ideal efficiency. Theoretically, splitting of water is associated with an enthalpy value of 285.8 kJ per mole, which gives a Gibbs free energy of 237 kJ per mole under standard conditions. The Nernst equation translates that into a minimum potential difference of 1.23 volts that is needed to split water. In reality much higher potential differences must be applied. Electrolysis of pure water requires excess energy in the form of overpotential to overcome various activation barriers. Without the excess energy, the electrolysis of pure water occurs very slowly, due to the limited self-ionization of water. Pure water has an electrical conductivity about one millionth that of sea water. Many electrolytic cells may also lack the requisite electrocatalysts. The efficiency of electrolysis is therefore increased through the addition of an electrolyte, such as a salt, and the use of electrocatalysts. The main challenge for a future hydrogen propelled industry is that the electrolytic water splitting process has low efficiency, and therefore, Hydrogen is currently produced more affordably from fossil fuels, which, of course, is associated with the production of massive amounts of CO2. Generally, electrolytic water splitting makes only sense, if green energy sources are being used. Besides these established methods of producing hydrogen, there are also a number of further, in part quite promising techniques, for the efficient synthesis of hydrogen via water splitting. One set of examples is the direct photocatalytic water splitting method, where catalysts that utilize visible light, are used to produce hydrogen. 
These photocatalytic materials are typically based on titanium oxide, however, they are sensitive to impurities and can change and get inactive, when used repeatedly. Another less known, but highly efficient technique, lies in thermal water spitting. This is currently developed in conjunction with direct solar thermal power plants. In these power plants, mirrors focus the sunlight directly on an energy carrier, typically liquid salts. This energy is used for instance for producing water steam at very low losses. With the help of different types of redox reactions, this can be also used to directly produce hydrogen from the steam at very high efficiency. Considering the industrial production of hydrogen, and using best practice processes for water electrolysis, such as polymer electrolyte membrane, or alkaline electrolysis, which have an effective electrical efficiency of 70 to 80 percent, producing 1 kilogram of hydrogen, which has a specific energy of 143 megajoules per kilogram, requires about 50 to 55 kilowatt hours, which translates to 180 to 200 megajoules of electricity. This means, that the energy value of the hydrogen produced, is about 70 to 80 percent of the electricity used to split the water molecule. Steam reforming, has only around 65 percent efficiency, and produces massive amounts of CO2. However, the transcontinental transport of hydrogen in ships is a huge problem, and ruins this positive picture. It requires liquefaction of the hydrogen. In current processes up to 40% of the hydrogen's energy content is required for this step, which renders hydrogen transport very inefficient today. This brings the question up, whether ammonia instead of hydrogen, could be used as a carrier of energy made from renewable sources, with specific consideration of the energy efficiency of transcontinental transport. Already today, about 200 million tons of ammonia are produced worldwide every year, and about 75% of this is used for fertilizer production. The energy required for ammonia production corresponds to the huge amount of about 2% of the total global energy production. In the most commonly used production process, the Haber-Bosch process, the gases nitrogen and hydrogen react with each other at about 200 bar and 450 degrees Celsius, on an iron catalyst. The nitrogen is obtained by air liquefaction, and the hydrogen is nowadays nearly exclusively produced by steam reforming of natural gas or coal. This could be in future done by water splitting with renewable energy sources, rendering this process much more sustainable. Ammonia can also be produced in a fuel cell. In this process, water is split into oxygen, protons, and electrons at the anode, coated with a catalyst. The protons diffuse through an electrolyte and a membrane to the cathode. The electrons reach the cathode through a wire. At the cathode, nitrogen molecules are split into nitrogen atoms by means of a catalyst, which can then react with the protons and electrons to form ammonia. The gaseous reaction product ammonia is liquefied either by cooling or absorption in water. Ammonia is gaseous under normal conditions, and has a density of 0.73 kg per cubic meter. At minus 33 degree centigrade it is liquid, and has a density of 0.68 kg per liter. Under only 9 bar pressure, it can be liquefied at 20 degrees Celsius. Ammonia is toxic, but people smell ammonia even in the smallest, harmless concentrations. When it is burned, only nitrogen and water are produced. Currently, about 0.6 kg of methane or an energy of about 30 MJ which is about 8.3 kWh, are needed to produce 1 kg of ammonia. This would in a sustainable future energy transport scenario of course have to come from renewable energy sources. The heating value of ammonia is 5.2 kWh per kg. This corresponds to a current production efficiency of 65%. To put it firmly, the caloric value of ammonia is thus about twice as high as that of liquid hydrogen, but only about half as high as that of gasoline or diesel. Therefore, ammonia could be a viable alternative, 
as an energy carrier for transporting hydrogen in ships across the ocean, at higher efficiency than transporting the liquid hydrogen directly. When reaching the final customer, ammonia does not have to be used directly as a fuel, although suited for many applications, but it can be readily transformed back into nitrogen and hydrogen. Another option to bind, store, and transport hydrogen at lower energy losses, is to use liquid organic hydrogen carriers. An example substance is dibenzyltoluene. This is an inexpensive, non-toxic, less inflammable heat transfer oil. It consists of three benzene rings and absorbs gaseous hydrogen during hydrogenation, using a ruthenium catalyst at about 200 degrees Celsius and pressures above 5 bar. In the process, the double bonds in the benzene rings are broken. This allows the addition of up to 18 hydrogen atoms per carrier molecule. One liter of such carrier molecules binds about 600 liters of gaseous hydrogen. This corresponds to a storage density of about 2 kWh per kilogram. Heat of 0.6 kWh per kilogram is released by the addition of hydrogen. The release of hydrogen occurs at about 300 degrees centigrade and reduced pressure. Hydrogen can be stored mechanically, through compression or as a liquid at low temperatures, or in the form of chemical compounds that release it upon demand. While large amounts of hydrogen is produced, it is currently mostly consumed at the site of production, notably for the synthesis of ammonia. Hydrogen storage becomes increasingly important when using it as a medium for storing energy, for example to compensate for intermittent energy sources. The overarching challenge is the very low boiling point of hydrogen. It boils at around 20 Kelvin which translates to minus 253 degrees Celsius. Achieving such low temperatures requires significant energy, leading to losses of up to 40% of its embodied energy. At 800 bar pressure, gaseous hydrogen, reaches the volumetric energy density of liquid hydrogen. But at any pressure, the volumetric energy density of methane gas exceeds that of hydrogen gas by a factor of 3.2. The common liquid energy carriers, such as methanol, propane, and octane, also known as gasoline, surpass liquid hydrogen by factors 1.8 to 3.4. Hydrogen is a synthetic energy carrier. It carries energy generated by some other processes. Electrical energy is transferred to hydrogen by electrolysis of water. But high-grade electrical energy is used not only to produce hydrogen, but also to compress, liquefied, transport, transfer, or store the medium. In many cases, particularly when used in the same region, the electrical energy could be distributed directly to the end user, at much higher efficiency. In such cases, that is, for stationary applications, hydrogen therefore competes with grid electricity. Furthermore, liquid synthetic hydrocarbons could also serve as the general energy carrier of the future, particularly when far distance transport between production sites and customers becomes necessary. How is hydrogen best transported? Several types of delivery paths are conceivable. Their respective suitability and energetic efficiency, depend on the carrier gas or liquid, and the carrier's aggregate state, that is used to bind and transport the hydrogen, and its associated embodied energy. Also, the overall efficiency depends on the envisaged transport distances, as well as on the question, whether the hydrogen is to be used locally or, for instance, on another continent. Hydrogen must be transported from the production point to the point of use, and be handled within refueling stations or stationary power facilities. There are four different delivery methods. Gaseous hydrogen delivery, cryogenic liquid hydrogen delivery, solid hydrogen carriers, or liquid hydrogen carriers. The present solutions for hydrogen transportation are divided into road and rail transportation, and hydrogen pipelines. Hydrogen ocean transportation is also emerging, as a promising alternative that will be available in the near future. However, as discussed before, liquid hydrogen transport is usually the least efficient one among these different options, 
particularly for the case of transcontinental shipping, owing to the high amount of energy that is required to render gaseous hydrogen liquid. Therefore, shipping hydrogen across oceans might be more efficient when using a suited hydrogen carrier, such as oils or ammonia. When using hydride materials for transport, it has to be considered what the associated values for the bond strength, as well as the charging and desorption kinetics are. For instance, some hydrides provide a very high bond strength of several hundred kilojoules per mole, which enable in part a very high concentration of hydrogen of nearly 20% in the solid state, yet, this comes at the cost of slow desorption kinetics. Let us take a look at the principle of a fuel cell. A hydrogen fuel cell is an electrochemical machine that uses a spontaneous redox reaction to produce electrical current. The net reaction is exothermic. Molecular oxygen is reduced at the cathode and combined with protons to form water. This means that fuel cells work in a similar way to batteries, meaning that a chemical reaction between anode and cathode provides electrical energy. In most fuel cell concepts, hydrogen and oxygen are the two reaction partners, but other redox reactions can be realized in fuel cells too. A separating layer, a proton permeable membrane, separates the two electrodes. Hydrogen flows into one, oxygen into the other. The dihydrogen gas is split into its components, two electrons and two protons. The protons are channeled through the membrane into the other half, into which oxygen flows. The electrons are diverted through an electric circuit to reach the oxygen on the other side where there is a shortage of electrons. Water is then produced from the protons, electrons and oxygen. The circuit's voltage is around 1.2 volts, about as much as in a small torch battery. Just as batteries can be connected in series to generate higher voltages, so it is possible with fuel cells. They need to be stacked on top of each other, which is called a fuel cell stack. Hydrogen used today is dominated by industry, namely, oil refining, ammonia production, methanol production, and steel production. Virtually all of this hydrogen is supplied using fossil fuels, so there is significant potential for emissions reductions from clean hydrogen. In transport, the competitiveness of hydrogen fuel cell cars depends on fuel cell costs and refueling stations while for trucks the priority is to reduce the delivered price of hydrogen. Shipping and aviation have limited low-carbon fuel options available and represent an opportunity for hydrogen-based fuels. In buildings, hydrogen could be blended into existing natural gas networks, with the highest potential in multifamily and commercial buildings particularly in dense cities while longer-term prospects could include the direct use of hydrogen in hydrogen boilers or fuel cells. In power generation, hydrogen is one of the leading options for storing renewable energy, and hydrogen and ammonia can be used in gas turbines to increase power system flexibility. Ammonia could also be used in coal-fired power plants to reduce emissions. One important future trend are gas turbines, that can be operated with different types of fuels, including hydrogen-rich gas mixtures. The use of hydrogen as an additional fuel component is not only a target for stationary gas turbines, but in future also for flying jet engines. This creates challenges for turbine designers and materials scientists. Firstly, Hydrogen-containing gases lead to combustion temperatures far above those encountered in conventional gas turbines, up to 400 degrees Celsius above the conventional operating temperature of these engines, when fueled by methane only. It must be also considered that hydrogen's laminar flame speed is more than three times that of methane, and the auto-ignition delay time of hydrogen is more than three times lower than that of methane. Such combustion atmospheres, created by hydrogen blended fuels, can provide 2 to 3% higher efficiency, but they require also to choose advanced materials and thermal barrier coatings that can withstand such severe creep and corrosion conditions. 
Another challenge is high temperature hydrogen embrittlement, which can lead to sudden and catastrophic failure of metallic components. This applies particularly to mixed load cases, where the turbine goes through a typical operational sequence of complex thermal, mechanical, and chemical loading scenarios, where hydrogen can enter the material, get trapped at lattice defects, and finally cause delayed cracking through enhanced local plasticity, interfacial decohesion, or nanoporosity through superabundant vacancy agglomeration. There are multiple opportunities for basic and applied materials research in this field. Materials are needed for the production and transformation of hydrogen and its related energy carriers, as well as for their storage, transport, distribution, use, and for all the underlying process and infrastructure parts. A hydrogen-based economy also requires materials to provide the green electrical energy for water splitting. Examples are steels for the highly mechanically loaded bearings and offshore constructions of wind turbines, advanced magnetic materials for the electrical generators, semiconductors for solar cell absorbers, and corrosion and abrasion resistant materials for hydropower plants, to give but a few examples. New catalyst materials are also needed in the fields of water splitting and ammonia synthesis. These materials must withstand less pure reactants and long-term use. The environmentally friendly production of green hydrogen using photoelectrochemical processes requires research into new materials that can be used as electrodes or catalysts. Currently, materials with low stability are used. They change their structure after a short time, and lose activity. Elucidating their nanostructure and composition and increasing their stability are essential tasks. Furthermore, new materials for fuel cells, especially polymer-based ones, have to be developed. High-strength materials that resist hydrogen embrittlement are required for the long and short term as well as for the stationary and mobile storage of hydrogen and its related carriers. The same applies for hydrogen distribution, for instance tubes, pipes, and valves. This task also includes better understanding of the underlying mechanisms of hydrogen embrittlement. One of the most important sources of global CO2 emissions is the reduction of iron ore with carbon. Replacing carbon by hydrogen as reducing agent, requires a number of considerable changes in ore processing and reduction procedures, on which numerous basic investigations are still pending. Therefore, basic research must be conducted on the reduction of iron ores by hydrogen, be it as an additional reductant in blast furnaces, in direct reduction, or even in plasma operations. Using hydrogen as a fuel in both, stationary and flying gas turbines requires substantial basic and applied research efforts on improved high temperature materials, coatings, and the mechanisms of hydrogen embrittlement under these harsh conditions. We have now reached the end of this class. I hope you enjoyed it. It gave only some first insights to the role of materials science in a hydrogen economy. A full lecture series about sustainable materials science and engineering is given at the Max Planck Institute in Dusseldorf and at RWTH Aachen.